Thank you very much. My job here is to give you an overview of pandemics and how they relate to seasonal influenza. I'm going to concentrate on past pandemics. And since, as you have heard, I'm going to be talking again in the fourth panel, I'll try at that point to talk about the most recent pandemic in terms of lessons learned. Okay, so what is an influenza pandemic? And I think what is different here, and I'll say this before we go through these points, is that not all pandemics are disasters. And I think that's one of the problems we got into in the most recent 2009 pandemic, and I'll go through the history and show why I think that happened. Pandemics may be disasters, but most of them have not really been global disasters. We know what viruses can cause a pandemic. They are always type A influenza viruses, and we'll hear more about the various kinds of viruses. We have both type A and B influenza. And the requirement here is that it has to be different from the previous type A virus that was circulating. It also has to be transmissible from person to person. Obviously, you can't have a global event such as a pandemic if the virus doesn't spread easily. Historically, we know that a substantial segment of the population has little or no immunity to the virus. In other words, they have not encountered this virus before. But as I will show you from a historic standpoint, that doesn't mean that all of the population is susceptible. Generally, older people in the population may have experienced that virus or something similar before. But when a pandemic occurs, it spreads all over the world relatively quickly. Over a period of months and with global transportation being what it is, weeks. And we wondered before the 2009 pandemic how quickly a, a virus could spread, and now we know it can spread very quickly indeed. Now this does create something different from the kinds of disasters we have been talking about before. Because disasters of the natu typical natural disasters, and influenza is a natural disaster, are limited to geographic areas. So international arrangements for pandemic control might mean that non-affected areas will help affected areas. However, if the entire world is involved, then the issue may come down to sharing limited resources. If there is a need everywhere at the same time. Now, this is the influenza virus, and I wanted to point this out uh, make, uh, because we need to know a little bit about influenza terminology before we start getting into the history of pandemics. And we have two surface proteins on the virus, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. The hemagglutinin changes, as does the neuraminidase, but the hemagglutinin changes faster. And Professor Webster will go into details about this. But the reason I wanted to mention this now 
was that we identify our viruses by terming, uh, by, by the hemagglutinin and the neuromididase, so that the recent pandemic was H1N1, and previous pandemics have been H3N2 and the rest. And this is the critical thing to know about an influenza virus. The terminology is based on these surface proteins that produce the immunity in the population which protects you at least partially against the next exposure. Now, I'm going to go through a series of pandemics that we know about. And we've had three pandemics in the 20th century and one in which we do have some information uh, previously, and that is a pandemic which started in, uh, in Russia in 1889. And the reason I want to show you this is because for the first time we started to identify the population groups that were most affected in terms of death. And here you see data from the state of Massachusetts. This is before the United States collectively col uh, gathered data from all of the states. And here you can see that it was the old and the very young that experienced deaths from pandemics. Now this is the typical pattern. This is the pattern that we see with seasonal influenza. And I'm going to end by reminding you that Influenza occurs on a regular basis. The difference between seasonal influenza and pandemic influenza is that seasonal influenza, there is immunity in the population, so you don't get this big, widespread uh, occurrence in the, in the world at large. So this is what we think of as the typical occurrence of influenza, but there's a little nuance here, a little question that has been raised in the UK because it seems that some observers thought that looking back over vital statistics, data that governments gather, that there was a higher than usual frequency of deaths in younger individuals. I bring this up because the next pandemic, the one that we always hear about, was the 1918 pandemic, where this pattern was very clear. This is what made the 1918 pandemic so much worse than others. And these are data from the United States, just to give you the kinds of numbers. We know that half a million Americans died in 1918. From influenza, it was not because of poverty. I just read an article saying that it was poverty, it was all sorts of other things which caused deaths in 1918. It was not. We still don't fully understand the reasons, but half a million died at that point with the U.S. population now being the, uh, what it is, over 300, uh, 300 million. This would be about 2 million deaths. 1957, much milder pandemic. 1968, even less severe. So you could not call 1968 a disaster, whereas 1918 was clearly a disaster. And these are the different viruses that caused the pandemics, again, identified by their hemagglutinin and neuromididase. Now, who died in this pandemic? What was different was that young adults died. And it wasn't because of the military. It wasn't because this was the end of the, second, uh, the First World War. We still don't fully understand the reasons behind it. We think it's something about the virus. And you're going to hear more about that from Professor Webster. It looks like younger people died during this pandemic, and they did. There are some real questions about whether older people died or were partially protected. 
And the reason these data were put together as they were is that they were looking at annual statistics. Who died in the full year of 1918? And in fact, in the first part of the year, there was a seasonal outbreak. And we think, and I'll show you some data to sustain this from the United Kingdom, that there was relative protection of older people during this pandemic, which meant that this was not a totally new virus to the human population. And here are the data. And when I show this to a class, I ask them, do you think females were at particular risk of influenza in 1918? And you have to think back about what else was going on in 1918. And all the healthy men in England and Wales were off in France and other places fighting the First World War. So the data are given only for women in England and Wales. And you can see the blue is the previous seasonal outbreak. And the yellow is the pandemic outbreak. And you see what happened in young younger individuals, young adults, but it goes down in older individuals, which just tells you that we've had this virus around before, not totally new. And there are data from local sources, from publications. I sent a graduate student of mine to the library just to see what he could find and it was not a new observation. You can see if you subtract what occurred in 1918 from regular numbers, you can see that the actually fewer people died, older people died in 1918 than would be anticipated based on seasonal outbreaks. Now, you've heard numbers bandied about in terms of how many died in 1918. When I got into this business, the number was 20 million globally. Well, it turns out that you pull out a contemporaneous uh, book and you find that 12.5 million died in India alone, where they were keeping very good statistics. Other parts of the world had similarly high numbers of deaths. And this is why the 50 million number is now the one that is generally accepted as the one, uh, the result of the 1918 pandemic, truly a disaster. And uh, how quickly did this pandemic go through the United States? It was introduced in about the end of August in the East Coast in Boston. And remember, no planes, some cars, bad roads, and therefore the railroad was the only way that people got around. And still, it crossed the country in about 10 weeks. These, this is the peak in the United States. So the virus did spread. And uh, there's a debate now in terms of what how much bacteria were involved. Now, why is this an issue? The question is, how much are you going to be able to mitigate, to lessen the effect of the pandemic through antibiotic stockpiling, as opposed to antiviral stockpiling? Antibiotics work against bacteria. And there's clearly good evidence that primary viral pneumonia, which couldn't be affected by bacteria, was involved in a fair number of individuals, and these are x-rays, again, graduate student going to the library and finding all this evidence, and it looks a good deal like avian influenza, H5N1 influenza that we've seen more recently. Now, how long did it take people to die? We read that people just dropped dead. They died very suddenly. In fact, these are hospitalization data and it, the peak day of death after hospitalization was 10 days. 
Now this has enormous implications in terms of the number of hospital beds, how you would take care of large number of ill individuals because with our current medical technology, people do not typically die the way they did in 1918, but it will take them a long time to get out of the hospital. In the most recent pandemic, people were in intensive care for weeks at a time, and if it had gone on longer in localities, there would really have been a disaster, even though this was not a disastrous pandemic, the 2009 pandemic. And we learned about pregnant women again. This is deaths in pregnant women in 1918, and you can see various years, and then here hits 1918, and the death rate in pregnant women went up because of this pandemic. In 1947, and I'll go through this rather quickly, it's a minor point, there was a change in this virus. Nobody noticed a pandemic, but the vaccine stopped working. Now, vaccines have to be specific to the virus. Antivirals do not. And this might have been termed a pandemic if we had been doing surveillance and had been watching things, and then we would have been totally wrong about our ability, uh, 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 about the pandemic spread of this virus. This is the challenge, making decisions early. And you have to make decisions early because if you're going to have vaccine production, you need time to produce vaccines. Sometimes it is very hard, even with modern techniques, to be able to predict exactly what is going to happen. This is a challenge we're now addressing. 1957, a real pandemic. And it started out in Hong Kong, as far as we knew, but in reality, it had been going on in China, which was closed from the rest of the world for several months before that time. And what is interesting here is that it started out in Asia, in Japan. There was a spring wave. It went down in its occurrence, and then there was a fall wave. This is exactly what we experienced with the 2009 pandemic in the United States. Because it came, this one came from Asia. It got seeded or spread within the United States, no big outbreaks until the autumn, until schools opened, and then everything took off. And this was the pattern we saw in the United States when schools opened in the autumn. And the big peak in the U.S. was in October 1957, before the usual flu season. We usually expect to see influenza in the middle of the winter or early winter into early spring but there was a second wave. And this is pretty much what we've experienced with the 2009 pandemic. So history does teach us some lessons. And as you've heard already, we need to learn from history. History also tells us that we have to start producing vaccines early before we know how severe a pandemic is going to be. And here you see that the vaccine became available in the United States in October and November, which was after the big wave, autumn wave, which was September, October. Again, history repeated itself. We had the same issue with the current pandemic, with the 2009 pandemic, in which the vaccine arrived as the autumn wave was decreasing. And this is one of the reasons why the U.S. government and others have invested a lot of money on being able to produce virus, uh, pandemic viruses, pandemic vaccines, because if there is a severe pandemic, a disastrous pandemic, 
then countries will not allow exports of vaccines produced in their borders. This is the worry. This is something in which there need to be arrangements. And the WHO has been trying to make sure that vaccines would be available for the countries where most of the people of the world live, namely those countries with less resource which do not produce vaccines. And if you look here at the 1957, the green line, you'll see it really had the same patterns with severity in the very young and the very old, but less severity very similar to our seasonal influenza outbreaks. 1967, another pandemic, another pandemic starting in Asia. And this is where we went wrong in the US thinking that the next pandemic was going to start in Asia when in fact the, pl the place where the pandemic was first identified was in Mexico, next door to the, to the United States. And in Hong Kong, it went through the population in a period of several weeks, spread to the United States and occurred mainly in the winter. And again, vaccine arrived only as the pandemic, the first wave of the pandemic was decreasing. Now this is important. And this shows pneumonia and influenza deaths, which are an indicator for influenza a surrogate indicator because it's hard to get straight virologic indications. And you can see here that the 1968 pandemic was twice as bad as the pre previous seasonal outbreak. So this is not a disaster. It's a disruption, but it is not a disaster. And this is the great challenge to try to figure out how severe a pandemic is going to be early enough so that you can decide what kind of measures need to be adopted because producing a lot of vaccine is expensive. But if you don't have it and the pandemic becomes more severe and there's some indication that the 1918 virus might have been milder and got more severe over time, if you don't have the vaccine, then you're really in trouble from a policy standpoint and a, and, and a health, public health standpoint. But those decisions need to be made early. Now, avian influenza really set in motion thinking about a pandemic. And because the death rate was about 80% in those who acquire the disease, everybody began to think of pandemics as being very severe. And the good part of all this was that pandemic planning really got going in all of the world, led by the World Health Organization. The bad side of it was that everybody began to associate pandemics with true major disasters. And when 2009 occurred, and I'm going to talk more about the 2009 pandemic in, on Sunday, people, especially in Europe, were concerned that we had overprepared, that we had too much vaccine available, and the press really got going on this, decided that this was a conspiracy between public health authorities and pharmaceutical companies, when in fact it was prudence to get ready for something more severe, which in fact did not evolve in that way. However, and I'll go into more detail on Sunday. You can see here, this is pediatric mortality. Deaths in young children. And the red there is the pandemic. With a spring wave in the United States, because we got it directly from Mexico. 
As a matter of fact, the virus is called A. California, which is in the vaccine, because it was identified first in California, spreading to California from Mexico. And the spring wave, the first red wave, and then the autumn wave. So children, young people were overly, were affected. There were not that many deaths, but significant disruption. Not a disaster, but disruption caused by this pandemic. And I'll talk about on Sunday, WHO decision making and the rest. This is an example, just a little bit of an example of what the issues are with the 2009 pandemic. So, I left out here 1977. In 1977, we had reintroduction of an H1N1 virus that had been spreading in before 1957. We think this was an artificial introduction, but what happened was that we've had H1N1 around since that time along with H3N2. This has created a little more confusion because our pandemic virus was H1N1, but it was significantly different from the previous H1N1 virus. Now, this is a little hard to read, but I was asked to talk about the future. And there is a theory based on checking bloods from individuals who were, let's say, alive uh, in bloods collected in 1956 before the H2 virus showed up. And then the H2 virus shows up in 1957, and you go to older people who lived through 1889, and you find antibodies to the H2 virus. This has resulted in the theory of recycling, that these viruses have a fixed cycle, and they reappear at a later time, having disappeared from the population. Therefore, the one that we might be worrying about now is H2N2. And remember, that was around for only 10 years. And therefore, this is a virus that we need to consider, along with the ones you're going to be hearing about from Professor Webster, the ones that are continuing to occur in bird populations, especially in Asia and in other parts of the world. So, the definition of a pandemic is not absolute, and as I will say, pre, uh, especially on Sunday, and this is a really important point from policy considerations, severity has not been part of this definition because it's hard to predict. We did see two other events in the 20th century which might have been called pandemics, which were not. We've had partial protection from all of our pandemic viruses. And this has been brought up about the recent pandemic. Why did old people not really get involved? Because they had partial protection from previous H1N1 virus. The recycling theory has been used to try to predict the unpredictable. And that's part of our problem. So H2N2 has to be kept in mind and, and this is uh, something which I will preach about over and over again, we have to f not forget about seasonal influenza. Influenza is around all the time. We can use seasonal influenza to test our strategies for control of influenza. And I'll really go over some of the strategies that have international implications when I talk again on Sunday. Thank you very much.